Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG After Foundation here today for another one of our conversations at home. Um, as with all our other videos, I do want to continue reminding everyone watching that we are continuing to raise funds for our COVID-19 fund, which is an emergency assistance fund to help SAG After those who are currently up for due to all of the closed film and television productions. So please check out the link to this below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way. Uh, today we are joined by the Clark Duke, who many of you know as an actor, um, who currently has an amazing film called Arkansas Out, which he has co-written, directed, and also stars in. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and just ask a little bit about the journey of the film, because this was one of the films that was supposed to be at South by Southwest, and, and you know, it's your feature debut, and it was the first time that you were going to be there as a filmmaker, and, you know, how, is, how has that been for you, and what did that really mean to you when you were going to be able to premiere the film at South by? Um, it, it was huge for me because I'm, I'm from the South, I'm from Arkansas, so that was the festival that, that I wanted to premiere the film at, like that was the festival I always had in mind for the film. Um, so it was, it was brutal because, you know, on the one hand, there's a big part of me that feels guilty and weird about even promoting a movie right now, but at the same time, it's like, um, you know, I've been trying to make it for like 10 years. <laughs> so it's like, I want people to see it. Um, so it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's a lot of conflicting emotions because it's like, um, you know, I don't want to like feel too sorry, real problems, but at the same time, yeah, I was, I was really devastated to be honest that uh, we didn't get to go to South by and it felt like, it felt like a, uh, we haven't got to do any of the, the fun parts of like releasing a movie. <laughs> like, like we had to skip, you know, South by and the premiere and um, the kind of like victory lap you usually get with something that kind of like, just to give you that catharsis and that final kind of a moment. But I, you know, as long as people find the film and see the film, um, it, that's good and it'll work out how it's supposed to. But I, I've never, I never got to watch it with an audience, so that's that's really um, that's that's really disappointing, to be yeah, honest. I can imagine. I hope that you get the chance to watch it with an audience once we're on the other side of, of this. In, in some way. Um, yeah, me too. I um, I you know, I don't know what that's gonna look like or what the world's gonna be, but um, I mean, I personally, you know, living in LA, we have uh, access to such great theaters, and you can watch so many independent films in theaters, so. I I miss going to the movies a lot the last however many weeks it's been and I hope that um I, I hope it comes back full force and there's not um a further narrowing of, of the movies that are offered in theaters. Like I hope I hope the I hope the corona thing doesn't just further contract the the movies that come out so it's not it can't we can't just watch Marvel movies, you know? <laughs> I wanted to um, jump into asking you a little bit about the genesis of the film and writing the script because it's based on John Brandon's book, Arkansas, and then you co-wrote it with and Andrea Brookring, and just kind of how that process came about and the way that you worked collaboratively together. Like, what did that look like? Were you sitting in a room together? Or were you sending pages back and forth and how you really navigated that space as a collaboration? Um, I optioned the book Arkansas about 10 years ago. Um, I just read it by chance because it was published by McSweeney's and they did good stuff and I was reading a ton of uh, their books at the time. Mm -hmm. And being from Arkansas, I was like, you know, kind of pulled in by that too. But then when I read it, the dialogue was so good, I was just blown away immediately. I was like, oh my God, I got to try to get this. Um, even kind of before I knew what to do with it, I was like, I have to like try, I have to try to get this and try to do it. Um, Andrew is one of my best friends since college. Um, as far as our process goes, it was, I don't think, I, I, I barely any of it was done in person. It was, it was mostly um, done remotely and pages sent back and forth. He initially, um, I wrote all the, for people that haven't seen the film, the film is divided up into kind of chapters, um, sections, kind of jumping around in time. I wrote the stuff that was uh, about Kyle and Swin, the character that me and Liam Hemsworth play. And then he wrote the stuff for Frog, Vince Vaughn's character. And then I kind of Frankenstein them together afterwards. And 
you know, did passes after that to make it coherent and of one voice and that kind of thing. Um, but it was, it was an interesting way, uh, it was an interesting way to write a movie, um, but it kind of worked for us and we've, we've written the, another script since then kind of in a similar fashion, another book adaptation. Um, but the, the biggest trick as far as adapting the book was figuring out the structure because, um, you know, the book is way more sprawling. The book is uh, laid out a little, even less linear than the film is to some extent. So once I figured out five act, um, everything else kind of quickly fell into place after that, but it took a while to figure that out. That was, that was kind of the biggest hurdle to run. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about the process of, of walking into a room and pitching yourself as a first time filmmaker because you've got such an established career as an actor, but this, you know, this was your first narrative feature and, and kind of what you did for yourself that made you walk into those rooms and, and how you kind of worked to gradually convince people that you really did have this very specific vision of what this film was going to be. Um, it was hard. I mean, the, the, having the career as an actor, gets you in the door to even have people look at your stuff. Um, and it especially helps, I think, when you're recruiting other actors to be in the movie. Like, I think it just does. Um, but it was still a pretty big challenge. Like, I, I mean, like I said, I've been trying to make this for a really long time. And um, almost nobody wanted me to direct it. I don't think, like, even my own, like, reps and, and uh, you know, the producers, like... <laughs> It, it, it was it was a real challenge. I mean, I mean, I don't. People keep at, I, this keeps coming up. Like, what's your advice to like people that want to uh, direct for the first time? And I, I just keep saying, don't let anybody talk you out of it, um, because a lot of people will try to. <laughs> and I know that even pre-production, that you know, you had to kind of reset a couple of times because of financial obstacles, and you know, shortly before going into filming, change the location of where you were even shooting the entire film. So by the time it came to you only had three weeks of, of pre-production. So how were you able to really harness those three weeks and make sure that once it was day one and you were filming, that everything was set and everything was ready to go and everybody knew their place in, in pulling everything together? It was pretty surreal. Yeah, we, we, um, we were location scouted on the ground in Arkansas where we were originally going to film. And then the, the state uh, film commission called and told us that they couldn't give us the tax credit. And we had this window we had to hit where we only had Liam and John Malkovich um, for this small window. So it was like, if we didn't make the movie now, basically, you know, you're probably not making the movie. Um, so it was truly wild. Like the three weeks of, of pre-production, everybody, again, everybody just kept saying, you can't do it. It's not possible. But myself and the first AD and the cinematographer, um, we literally went to Mobile, Alabama. We had no producer, no line producer. The movie didn't have a line producer, by the way, which is totally a whole other bizarre thing. Um, and literally the three of us drove around in a car with no oversight and somehow found the locations, put it all together, like made it happen. I just, my, my main advice for like, is just like, just fake it until it's real to some extent, like, because there was a lot of bullshitting involved on, on my part and the other producer, Patrick Hibbler's part of just like, the first day of production, I don't think we were officially financed. Um, like there was a lot of like, kind of like bluffing our way through it and just like, I, I was just kind of of the opinion, I'm gonna act as if the movie's real until you know someone, I guess, arrests us or kicks us out. Um, and it worked, <laughs> thank God it worked. But yeah, it was, it was nuts. It was nuts, and I like the raising the money, the packaging the movie together and raising the money is is by far the worst part, or the most stressful part of the process. The actual shooting the movie, like the production, was a blast. Like you know, you're exhausted, you're not sleeping, but like you're having such a good time, you don't care. But the raising the money was so brutal. Like I, I really. I dread doing that again slash hope I don't have to do that again. Like I started smoking again. Um, it, it, it was just like, it was killing me. Um, I think Patrick got an ulcer, like no, no, like no joke. He developed an ulcer. Um, it's rough. That's this, the singing for your supper is, uh, is, is the least fun part. It's real and it never goes away. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and then once you were actually making the film, what would kind of your, your day-to-day preparation for the next day look like when you finish shooting at the end of the night and you're going home and you're thinking, okay, this is what I have to film tomorrow. This is what I need to be ready when I walk into that in the morning. Because, you know, you're, pre- you're preparing for that side of things as a director, but also you're in a huge amount of the scenes as well. So you're still having to think about your performance at the same time. Yeah, it, it required a lot of compartmentalization. Um, to be honest, like kind of turning on and off different parts of your brain. Like I, you know, like I said, I would sleep about four, four hours a night um, while we were making the film. But and then on the way to work in the morning, I'm I'm riding to work with the first AD and the cinematographer. We're talking about what we got to do that day. And then at night, I'm riding home with those same guys, and we're talking about what we shot that day and what we have to do tomorrow. And um, it really if we if we hadn't been so and the three of us we were very um very organized and very like kind of militant about our shot lists and making our days and like we had to be really organized and be really like the like the prep that we did beforehand is sort of what allowed the movie to to be possible like we knew we couldn't you know just hose it down and shoot coverage like a tv show which i didn't want to do that anyway and i hate that anyway as an actor but but we were really like disciplined with the, the coverage we shot and like, um, it, yeah, it was it was tricky. I mean, I guess, I guess the, the the short answer is it was hard. It was it was hard. Um, but it just like speaks to how important. Like so much of directing is done in pre production. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you're sh- I know you're also shooting on a red camera and doing things like using a lot of like anamorphic lenses to really capture like a slightly filmic feel to it, the landscape that you were filming in. So, so why was it so important to you that using digital, it still kind of had that specific look and feel and, and how did you work, you know, with your GP to really make sure that that's the case? Well, I mean, you know, if it were totally up to me, I would have shot the movie on, on 35 millimeter, but the reality of shooting a movie uh, with a budget this low, which means you have to shoot super fast is, and we're shooting in Alabama. There's not labs. Like, you know, there's just like the logistics of it are just really hard. Um, like not to say it's impossible, but it's, it makes your life a lot harder. And, you know, we needed to be able to, to watch stuff back and know that we had it. And like, you know, I'm going, and I'm also like watching and doing a little bit of editing at night too, um, throughout the process. And, um, so the anamorphic was a way to to give it that that filmic look and that bigger feel and kind of um it's tricky like you you, you know it, it's tricky to me anytime you see a period piece that's not shot on film there's always kind of a like cognitive dissonance as a viewer of like oh this just doesn't feel exactly right so i i think the anamorphic help with that a lot um because it gives you that great kind of blurring around the edges you you know, the, um, and kind of the general weirdness that you get with the, the wider lenses. Um, and it definitely helped with the, uh, the, the stuff that said in the past, I think, to make it not feel, uh, just to make your brain not notice it was digital as much. But I, I think the movie actually has a really unique, interesting look with the red and the anamorphic. Like, I, I, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of stuff that looks exactly like it. Um, and visually, our point of reference was always um once upon a time in the west like that was kind of what we kept going back to as far as like kind of the the visual language and tone we were going for um and it was it was a lot of it was an attempt to give a sense of scale to what could be you know a small movie of just people talking because it is a very interior movie it's 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 a character piece about you know it's not some survey of the history of american crime in the south it's it's just the story of like these, basically these three people. Um, but I still wanted the movie to feel big, like, like Once Upon a Time in the West or like Casino or um, to those kind of big sweeping movies that I love. Yeah. I also want to 
talk a little bit about the specifics of directing the cast that you had. I mean, it's such an incredible cast from Vince Vaughn to John Malkovich to Liam Hemsworth and yourself, obviously. And I was just curious about, you know, as an actor, having that opportunity to be on set so much and really absorb and watch the different way that direct other directors work. What were some of the elements that you really wanted to pull into your specific style and, and, and also kind of how you navigated the fact that every single actor has their own approach and their own individual style and technique and, and way of working. So how you overall essentially communicated with each of them to make sure that you were getting the performance that you wanted to match your vision of the film. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is like having um, these huge actors like that makes your life so much easier because they're so good. Like John Malkovich doesn't need a lot of direction from me. Um, so that, that makes your life much easier, uh, to be totally honest. Um, I do think being an actor my whole life, it definitely helps you as a director because you're, you know, you're in the same boat as everybody, you know, what they're, you know, what they're going through. Um, and, and as, as far as, as far as my own career as an actor, like what I picked up from directors, it's almost like you learn more from the really bad ones. Um, Cause I've done a ton of TV, you know, like, I mean, I've probably, I don't know, like dozens or hundreds of hours of TV at this point, like over 30 years. Um, you learn more from the really terrible ones, like what you, like what not to do um, more than, <laughs> Almost more than you learn from uh, the good directors. And what was, what was your process and kind of flow with directing yourself as well? You know, because I was just curious about where you looked to in terms of your cast that you were sharing scenes with or perhaps your crew for, for that specific notes and, and feedback on yourself and your own performance. Um, well, as far as just like keeping the set running, you know, you lean a lot on your first AD and your cinematographer, like they're you know, they're, they're, they're kind of doing a piece of your job at that point when you're physically acting in scenes. Um, so I leaned on them a lot. I, I was lucky enough that, you know, like my brother is in the film. So he was, uh, he was, he played um, the guy that, that dies with John Malkovich. That's my younger brother. Oh, Chandler. Right. <laughs> so he was on set the whole, yeah. <laughs> so he was on set the whole time and was there to kind of keep me honest. Cause you know, nobody will tell you you suck more than your brother. And then, you know, I, like I said, I co-wrote the movie with uh, my best friend. So he's on set the whole time, you know, telling me. And um, one thing we did that I, I wish every, every shoot would do, um, but I never encountered before was, so I hired uh, the guy that plays the old Greek guy in the movie is uh, Barry Primus, who, who Barry, uh, Barry taught me method acting in college and he taught my brother. We both went to Loyola Marymount where Barry teaches. And so that was really fun for me to hire Barry, you know, after he had taught both of us. Um, but while he was there and I worked with Barry before the movie started for myself personally, just on my character. Um, but once he got there, he, he would do like the method warmups with us before we would shoot. And, and Liam loved it too. Um, not everybody wanted to do it, you know, like, like, I mean, really it was just me and Liam <laughs> that wanted to do it, but, but me and Liam loved it. And we ended up convincing production to keep Barry, um, there for the bulk of the shoot, just cause it was really nice for me to have him, to have him a watching the performance and kind of just like spend five or 10 minutes before seeing with me and Liam, like, stretching us out and us up and um, just kind of getting us getting us loose and ready to go so i i wish every production would just have a full-time uh like like method acting coach on set i don't, I don't know if, uh i mean like i said it's case by case like some people have no interest in it and don't want it because everybody's process is so different but i i love it and i would highly recommend it to anybody that's um anybody that's acting in something they're also directing and producing um it's nice to have have that guy around just to get you in the in the moment it's such a great idea. Yeah, I'm surprised that you don't hear about just acting coaches in general being on, on film sets as a more constant thing. Yeah, I, I kind of had the same thought because it's like, it, it was kind of like how you have, like on a basketball team, you've got assistant coaches and trainers, like, you know, that are doing drills and warming guys up. Like, like why not? Um, 
Yeah. I was also wanted to ask a little bit about, you know, the script process once you had your cast in, in place and, and obviously once you landed um, each of these actors, whether there was anything that you went back and, and tweaked a little bit, kind of just knowing their strengths, but also their specific styles as performers. Um, I can't really say that I, you know, to be honest, not really, didn't really change the script to match anybody. Um, cause I think the script was what attracted them to it to begin with. Like that was the only reason we got the actors was because they responded to the script. Um, so not, not especially like Liam was the first person that came on board. Um, and is the reason there is a movie yeah. because, uh, yeah, him saying yes is it, it's the, it's the weirdest chicken and egg scenario when you're trying to raise money for a movie because it's like nobody wants to finance the movie unless you have actors attached and none of the actors want to attach unless you already have financing so you're just for the longest time you're in this awful like purgatory of like uh, like you don't know how to start like how will this ever start and um liam saying yes was was what started for me yeah for, for, for my movie that's amazing. And I love watching the dynamic between the two of you on screen. And, and I was interested a little bit in, you know, you were, you're obviously talking about having your method acting coach on set once you were filming, mm -hmm. but, but kind of what that preparation between the two of you looked like prior to shooting and building the relationship, because, you know, the interesting aspect being that there isn't a backstory, there isn't a history, they actually meet in the film. So how much did you want to kind of prepare and, and figure out the nuances and the beats and the rhythms of their relationship? Um, we had a really natural kind of easy going rapport like from the jump and ended up um, becoming friends and are, and are still friends now. Um, I don't know, like, like some people you just have like a good chemistry with and, and Liam and Liam in real life is like hilariously funny and goofy. And I know he, you know, he just plays all these like tough action movie parts and stuff, but uh, the reality of Liam is he's really sly and really funny. Um, some of the people there is there is value to what you're saying though about that dynamic of like somebody the characters just mean for the first time so like it's kind of fun when you as an actor just meet him for the first time and it was very much like that with um with Vivica like I I met Vivica in person um, on set like the day she showed up to film that was the first time we had ever met. Um, cause I just offered the part to her, you know, side unseen, I'd never spoken to her, but I just knew she could do it. Um, so that was kind of fun cause you're kind of figuring it out in the moment. Like what, like you, you're getting honest reactions of like, you know, just how you're dealing with this person. Um, and Malkovich was like that to some extent. We, we, I read through everything I think once with John, I met John like a couple days before, uh, his scene started shooting. He came down for wardrobe and that kind of thing and that was pretty surreal like opening my hotel room door and John Malkovich standing there um because he's you know he's so good and he's been so good my whole life um that I was a little starstruck and a little intimidated with him initially just because like you know like where do I get off like giving John Malkovich direction type of thing yeah. um but luckily he is the loveliest nicest guy uh, and he also is is really funny, but like I think just his voice and demeanor, he can seem so intimidating. But once you get past that, you realize, oh, he's the funniest, nicest guy. Um, so he he was just a pleasure, and he was a guy that man talk about just like just a. Pro I mean, he's the most professional actor I've ever come across. Like he he makes everybody else look bad. I, I mean, just the most prepared. Like, just like stuff on set that you don't think about. Like, there's a take, and I think it's in the movie where, like, he closes a cabinet, and I noticed that, like, he closes it at a normal speed, but then he stops it without slamming it and gently closes it so it's not on top of dialogue. And just, like, stuff that you only get from having been in, like, 500 films, you know? But, but he said, I mean, he was so good with, like, working with the stunt and the fight coordinator to like figure that stuff out. Cause like, you know, he's directed film and theater and like, he's just done it all. And um, he, he was somebody who was fun to just like soak up and learn from just by being around. And he was so great with my, uh, with my brother. Um, which was, which was really fun to watch too. 
Yeah. What was that process for you in terms of working with the, the stunt team and, and the fight director and figuring out the choreography of those scenes? It was, that was, that was tricky because that's something I've never done anything close to before. Um, I mean, that's something I'm sure I'll be a lot better at on the second or third movie than I was on this one, to be honest. Um, I mean, the, the main thing I had in mind is, you know, I wanted the fights to feel kind of, kind of grimy and real. Like I didn't want them to be too sensational. So um, that, you know, just having that style in mind probably helped um, kind of hide some of the limitations I have as an action director. Um, yeah, that was tricky. That was tricky to, to be totally honest, like that stuff. But luckily, like I said, Malkovich has done so much of it before. And Vince had just come off of doing Brawl and Cell Block 99, um, where he had done so much fight coordinating. And, you know, so he, he was, um, like, he was such a valuable resource just because he, he'd done so much of it so recently. Um, and then, like, Vince does, like, I think he does, like, judo and, like, he, he likes all that shit. Um, so he, he, he was, he was, luckily I was surrounded by people that were, were good at it already. And Liam obviously has done, you know, huge, huge action movies. Um, and, was, and was really good at it too. I didn't really have to do any, thankfully, because I do not enjoy doing stunts at all. Uh, I don't ever want to do stunts again. <laughs> I'm the first person to be like, no, nope, put a wig on somebody. Like, there's no way. <laughs> It seems like because you wrote the film and you had the control over whether you had to be involved in that on this one. Yeah. I remember on a couple of years ago, on a, I was on the show called I'm Dying Up Here on Showtime. And they were, uh, we got to set and there was a scene where I was supposed to, like a guy's teaching me karate in my house. And this is like unannounced. Nobody's told me this. There's no stunt coordinator. No, nobody else. They're like, all right, so he's just going to grab you and flip you over onto your back on the floor. And I go, no, he's not. I go, what are you talking about? Where's, where's the stunt coordinator? Where's the double? Like, I was like, I'm calling SAG. Like, I'm not, there's, I'm not doing this. <laughs> so I, I am the first person to, uh, to say no to, to stunts. <laughs> One of the other things I wanted to ask you about was um, uh, Mark Duplass, because you, you've spoken previously about how his keynote that he gave at South by Southwest in, in 2015 was, was a really instrumental thing for you and that you learned so much from it, not just in terms of your career, but also that that really played into some of the ways that you thought about making this film. And so I was curious what some of the things were that translated into making this movie were that, that you took away from that speech. Yeah, that speech really got me. Um, I I didn't know Mark at the time. I do now a little bit because we did Room 104 together. And um, I'd been a big fan since Puffy Chair of just like his whole kind of philosophy to making movies too. Um, when he gave that speech, you know, the thesis of it was, was um, the cavalry is not coming. And that... That rang so true with me because that was also how I had really got started um, with Clark and Michael, you know, um, years ago. That was like my thesis film in film school and that's how I started. And, you know, I made that for $800. Um, and so after I saw Mark's keynote and it also kind of coincided with like, I had turned 30 and my grandfather um, passed away and I was just in the, the midst of this kind of like, I don't know, I guess like quarter life crisis, probably like I was unhappy with my career as an actor and the work I was getting and the stuff I was doing. And just hearing that just kind of reminded me like, what did you move out of here for? Like, what did you, what did you want to do? And like, the, when was the last time you were really happy doing it? And the conclusion I came to is like, oh, it was when I made Clark and Michael and I was writing and directing and making my own stuff. So pretty shortly after I saw Duplass's thing, it, it kind of lit this fire under me and I, um, I ended up writing and directing and starring in this pilot that uh, did not get picked up, but um, it was for TBS and I basically said, give me the script development money and I'm gonna go shoot something. And they just thought I was gonna go shoot like one or two scenes, but I ended up making this entire pilot for 50 grand. Um, and I really like, I really, I mean, they didn't pick it up and I didn't think they would because it was basically like a Robert Altman film. And I was, I just like, I was like, they're never going to make this, but, um, 
for me, it was kind of a proof of concept of like, I can do this, I can do this on a really low budget. And so after that, I was like, I'm going to make Arkansas. Like, I'm just going to put my money where my mouth is and just make it really cheaply, even if I have to self-finance it. And there was going to be a version of the movie that was going to be like, you know, a really, really bare bones, like affair. Um, but basically after I made my pilot, um, it motivated my agents. One of my, one of my own agents literally said, oh, you're a real director. And I said, you're my fucking agent. Like, what a thing to say. But yeah, thanks. Um, and then after that, they helped us find the money. And um, but yeah, it all kind of it all kind of a lot of it really started to snowball from me watching uh, Mark's keynote at South by, which was another reason that I was really excited to go to South by this year. Like it felt very full circle uh, for the process of the film. Yeah, and I know that you you know you've talked about. The, the whole experience of making this film essentially being the most fulfilling part of your career since you made that thesis film. Yeah. Um, and I was just curious in, in like what ways it really has fulfilled something that nothing else that you've been doing creatively has in that interim. I, you know, I just kind of felt like I was finally doing what I really was supposed to be doing and wanted to do. Um, I, I love acting and I, I love acting in the film. Um, and specifically like acting in the film and then acting on the last season of I'm Dying Up Here kind of made me enjoy acting again because it was like getting to stretch and do something I hadn't done before. But I, I love every part of it. You know, I love pre-production. I loved, I, I just love on set because it's probably just because it's like all I've ever done. But um, I, I loved, I loved editing. Like I've always, you know, I've always made shorts and, and done everything like operate the camera and, you know, edited all of them. Like, I, I just enjoy the whole process. Like, I like lighting. Um, I, I don't know. It just holds my interest more. Like, I, I get bored if I'm on set just as an actor, and I'm just kind of – because it's so much just – I mean, it, your life as an actor is hurry up and wait. Like, most of your day is, like, you know, it's like 11 hours of sitting around and one hour of acting. Um, so, for me, I, I just love the constant stimulus of it and the problem-solving. That's so wonderful. And, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry that the, the festival experience at South by was derailed, but I hope that you, you know and feel that you're, you're a South by Southwest filmmaker no matter what happened with the festival this year. And the film is coming out on May 5th, which is also your Thank birthday. You. Happy birthday. And I hope that so many audiences discover this film and connect with it online and in the way that you want it to. It's, it's a really great piece of work. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it'll be a nice birthday present for me if everybody would go watch the movie. I'd really appreciate it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Clark. Really appreciate that. My pleasure.